To deny our own impulses is to deny the very thing that makes us human. Over the years, within the Western anime community, there has been a growing number of discussions regarding the relationship between pedophilia and lolicon. But without proper definition and premises, the discourse often leads nowhere and creates confusion between parties arguing their positions. And with the increase of people using the internet, the world becomes more interconnected and the idiosyncrasies of communities often clash with those outside of such groups, causing whiplash or shock for those that are not privy to what is typically the norm. A clear definition of lowly art must be established so that people can understand why some people assume the label of lolicon and why lowly art must be protected. In general terms, lowly art is defined as an artistic illustration of a child. But while aesthetic drawings are typically that of a prepubescent child, in fiction, it is not limited by age. In a narrative, a character can be described as being over the legal age, yet still look and act as a child. As such, for the purposes of this video, a lowly is synonymous with childlike body in an artistic setting. Therefore, a person that assumes the label lolicon implies that they enjoy artistic drawing of childlike characters, sexual or otherwise. However, the confusion begins when the accusation of being sexually aroused by such depictions implies intrinsic pedophilia. At face value, it is understandable to treat both as synonymous, but they are not the same. The word lolicon originates from the book Lolita and is a Japanese contraction of Lolita complex. A person calling themselves a lolicon instead of a pedophile is an important distinction etymologically and epistemologically due to the connotations of pedophilia. In recent years, there has been a growing movement by certain groups to make pedophilia an accepted sexuality, to limited success. The failure can be attributed to how human beings rationalize everything in the world by their nature. Following the law of identity, it is assumed that a pedophile will eventually follow their nature and abuse children. While many may argue that there is an obvious difference between a pedophile, someone that has the potential to break the law in a particular way, and a child molester, someone that has already broken it by abusing a child, the general public considers a pedophile to be a potential future child molester, and thus are a hazard by their nature. However, so long as a pedophile has not broken the law, they should still be considered citizens with rights. Society should discriminate against child molesters that have abused children, but not pedophiles that have done nothing wrong. The problem is that it is hard not to treat a pedophile as though they are a potential threat. No parent would want to have their child around a pedophile, for fear that they may do something. As such, the distinction between lolicon and pedophile is important, because if those that consider themselves pedophiles were to live their lives without touching children and label themselves as lolicons, it would signal that they have no intention of abusing children. They recognize that their sexual desires are illegal and will only reside within their mind through art. And lolicons that are not pedophiles can declare that they enjoy artistic drawings of children, sexual or otherwise, and never had any intention of touching children in the first place. Simply put, a pedophile can be a lolicon, but a lolicon may not be a pedophile. And equally, a child molester can be a lolicon or a pedophile, but a lolicon may not be a pedophile or child molester. The terms are not synonymous, so it is irresponsible to assume that a lolicon is a pedophile or a child molester until proven otherwise. Of course, the desire to suppress pedophilia is a natural reaction within a liberal society. Under the view that children are unable to consent to sex due to being young, it has given rise to the ideology that children must be protected. Abusing children is seen as a form of rape and is treated as such by law. Although some pedophiles might argue that children have their own sexual desires at a young age, the use of coercion and manipulation are typically required to sexually assault children. Our current liberal society ideologically commoditize children as pure and innocent, and adults cannot infringe on that sexual innocence until children learn sex by themselves and have reached the age of consent. 
Because of this, by law, pedophiles must never ever be allowed to have sex with children. And nobody should think it is acceptable to altruistically sacrifice children to sate the urges of pedophile simply because children may have sexual desires at a young age. Therefore, as long as we live in a liberal society, child abuse will remain illegal. But at the same time, pedophiles are still human, regardless of how someone may see their sexuality as a perversion. They have the right to live, to find happiness, and to be members of society. The problem, of course, is that indulging in their sexual desires would be impossible without breaking the law. This is the reason why lowly art is important. Pornography is human imagination in theatrical action. It is the visual or textual representation of sexual acts, presented and enjoyed exclusively for their titillating characters. Since masturbation is nothing more than sexual self-sufficiency, pornography allows people to indulge themselves in the privacy of their own home. Lowly art becomes a self-contained, non-threatening outlet for pedophiles and those curious enough to look at such taboo content without acting on it in real life. A study done by Milton Diamond, Pet Weiss, and Eva Josepkova showed that in the Czech Republic, after decriminalizing all possible explicit sexual content, including child pornography, there was a rapid decline in the number of reported cases of child abuse. The study also showed similar results in Denmark and Japan. The belief that more pornography will lead to widespread moral degeneracy and social upheaval is possibly wrong. However, those results should not be taken as justification to legalize all types of pornography. Lowly art should be legal, while child pornography should remain illegal. A common misconception is that child pornography and lowly art are similar since they may have similar audiences. However, it is important to distinguish the differences between sexualized lowly art and child pornography. The central focus is the creation of art and child abuse. Art is defined as a recreation of reality to convey values and potentially evoke emotional responses. Video pornography, on the other hand, in its purest form and by its nature, is not intrinsically art because it is simply a documentation of sex. It lacks transformation or recreation, even if it evokes sexual responses. However, Art can be of a pornographic nature. Lowly art differs from child pornography because its creation is not simply a depiction of reality but requires to be created by an artist. Art has intrinsic value because it could not exist without the skill and mind of an artist. Child pornography is the visual depiction of a crime without any recreation. It is correctly outlawed because it is an accessory to crime abusing children and storing it for further viewing and the pleasure of others. No matter what, child pornography requires an abused and abuser. Lowly art does not. Japan has had a long history of debating the correlation between fiction and reality. As Patrick Galbraith comments in the book The End of Cool Japan, in the context of its use, among manga and anime fans in Japan in the 1970s and 1980s, Lolicon was not associated with child pornography or the desire for actual children, but rather the desire for manga slash anime style cute, cartoony girl characters. In the 1990s, the debate about harmful manga in Japan concluded that manga, whatever the contents of the drawings may be, does not harm anyone in its production and does not cause demonstrable harm to others in its distribution and consumption. Fiction can open up imaginary dimensions of sex and allow people to work through them. It was precisely because of this long history of debating the connection and distinction between fiction and reality that Japan decided in 2014 that manga and anime, whatever the contents of the drawings may be, should not be categorized as child pornography. However, this sort of artistic sexual liberation comes at a cost. Since the 1970s, Japan implemented a general obscenity law against genitals being depicted. So long as private parts are covered up, 
or not directly shown, almost any form of pornography and art is allowed to be published. This is generally known as the weird black censorship bar that can be found when looking at Japanese pornography. As Mark McLeland notes in New Media Censorship and Gender, using obscenity laws to restrict, another form of speech that is closely monitored by most Asian nations is obscenity, including but not limited to visual forms of pornography. Japan has legal provision that forbids the production and dissemination of obscene material, but the legislation does not offer a clear description of what constitute obscenity. In Japan, since the 1970s, pornography has been legal so long as it is clearly marked as adults only and no genitalia or pubic hair is clearly visible. These restrictions apply equally to depictions of real people or imaginary manga style characterization. In the United States, there are similar measures of obscenity, but greater emphasis and protection is given regarding free speech. The PROTECT Act of 2003 is a US law with the stated intent of preventing child abuse as well as investigating and prosecuting violent crimes against children. Illustrations, sculptures, and pictures depicting minors and actions are required to pass the Miller Test of Obscenity in order to become illegal. The Miller Test is straightforward. Speech or expression must fit one of these three criteria to not be considered obscene and protected under the First Amendment. Number 1. Whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work, taken as a whole, appeals to prurient interest. Number 2. Whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct or excretory functions specifically defined by applicable state law. Number 3. Whether the work, taken as a whole, lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. The first clause is based upon the reaction of an undefined collective, effectively as to whether they feel offended. The definition of a community can refer to a house, a street, a city, a state, or the entire country. This complicates matter even more when applied to the internet where one internet community may accept obscene material but another may not. Even more confusing, the average person required to judge art is impossible to define. If anything, an average person is defined as having no unique qualities. The second clause regards anything that can be deemed too sexual in nature, again defined by an undefinable collective. The third clause is the most important. If a work has any literary, artistic, political, or scientific value, it is protected under free speech. Lowly art may be deemed to have prurient interest by community standards. It may be overly sexual in nature, but by being an artistic drawing requiring a recreation of reality, it is protected under the third clause. Because of this, in the United States, lowly art is not illegal. While each individual state may regulate what is imported, the creation and consumption of lowly art is legally allowed. Other countries, however, are not as lenient. In Canada, between 1992 and 2001, after the R. V. Butler case, Pornography was judged under its own laws of obscenity by the standards of undue explicit sex with violence within a narrative context and artistic intent. Child pornography was only prosecuted if it depicted actual children. During that time period, lowly art was permitted. However, the laws regarding child pornography have become draconian ever since the R. V. Sharp 2001 case. The preceding judge found that person included both actual and imaginary beings on the ground that pornography was deemed to be of so little value in terms of free speech that protecting children from sexual exploitation was more important. Slippery slope arguments were presented as a justification for banning lowly art. It did not claim that women and children were directly exploited by pornography, but 
that audiences viewing obscene materials may be influenced and act differently in the future. Understanding the ruling of the Butler and Sharp cases gives us an insight to the central conflict at hand. Quoting the Butler case, It is not susceptible to exact proof. There is a substantial body of opinion that holds that the portrayal of person being subjugated to degrading or dehumanizing sexual treatment results in harm, particularly to women, and therefore to society as a whole. While the direct link between obscenity and harm to society may be difficult, if not impossible to establish, it is reasonable to presume that exposure to images bears a causal relationship to changes in attitude and beliefs. And with the Sharps case, Parliament sought to prevent not only the harm that flows from the use of children in pornography, but also the harm that flows from the very existence of images and words which degrade and dehumanize children and to send the message that children are not appropriate sex partners. The focus of the inquiry must be on the harm of the message of the presentations and not on their manner of creation or the intent or identity of their creator. Given the low value of the speech at issue in this case and the fact that it undermines the Charter of Rights of Children, Parliament was justified in concluding that visual works of the imagination would harm children. The central fear being echoed is whether we can be sure that obscene material will not potentially cause harm from its very existence. How can we know that lowly art will not be used as a way to potentially coerce a child into sex? Or what if people experiencing lowly art develop an urge to abuse children? These two questions can be answered in a court case involving child pornography in the United States. In 2012, the Child Pornography Prevention Act was successfully challenged in Ashcroft v. Free Speech Coalition for its overly broad definition of a minor. The Free Speech Coalition feared that Congress's expanded definition of child pornography would endanger their legitimate activities and filed a lawsuit seeking to enjoin enforcement of the CPPA in the United States District Court for Northern District of California. There were two provisions that were contested and found to be overbroad in restricting speech. The first was the proposition that virtual child pornography, such as lowly art, could be used to entice children into sex. The courts found this to be an overreach because anything, such as candy, could be used as solicitation. It would be irrational to ban everything in an attempt to protect children since all items are neutrally commoditized. The second proposition is that virtual child pornography could whet the appetite and eventually lead people to engage in sexual abuse with a minor. The court argued that the harm to children is very indirect and the effect on free speech would be too great. Because of this, the law was deemed to be too broad as it would ban other speech while not doing an effective job to directly prevent the abuse of children. The Child Pornography Prevention Act was later changed with the PROTECT Act of 2003, allowing lowly art to exist if it passed the Miller test. Comparing Canadian cases on child pornography with those of the United States shows the heart of the issue. Canada values free speech but not as much as the United States. For Canada, pornography is seen as having so little value that any artistic expression involving children is deemed irrelevant by conveying the message that children must not be seen as potential sex partners and may cause harm in some undefined and indirect way. In comparison, the United States protects all art as speech unless someone is directly harmed in the making of the art. Therefore, two central premises are at odds. The value that free speech must be protected absolutely unless it infringes on the rights of others and the ideology that children must be protected at all costs. To unravel this contradiction, it is important to understand the essence of free speech and ideology. At its core, an ideology is a system that shapes how you see the world. They are religions, philosophies, scientific systems, social norms, laws and regulations, 
commands of others, etc. They can be conscious or unconscious and are often both. Ideology is the spontaneous relationship we have towards society. It has a positive core that becomes mystified and made an absolute. Following an ideology to its core shows not only what it values, but also the repulsive elements that it attempts to hide and tame. Building on the topic of lowly art, the general ideology that children must be protected, even at the cost of low-value speech, such as artistic pornography, stems from the belief that children must not be thought of in a sexual manner, because it is repulsive. A good example of this ideology from the Western anime community can be found in a video from the popular anime YouTuber Douchebag Chocolate. Oh, they're 2D, so it doesn't matter. And that right there is one of the worst mistakes anyone can make when accepting themselves as lolicons. Yeah. I'm proud to be a lolicon. Yeah. No, you're a pedophile, a term that's far less glamorous than the former, but equally as synonymous, regardless of how you want to sugarcoat it. But Demo, they're not real. I have no interest in filthy 3D children. Behold the last line of defense. This is likely what you'll hear more than anything else when discussing this topic, and it is quite easily the most disturbing counter-argument in the arsenal. If you think this way, you seem to be under the misconception that we're all rallying for the rights of fictional characters, when in reality, it is the idea that is most volatile, not just the actions. You act as though since there's no action, i.e. you not raping little girls in the real world, then everything is fine, when no one's actually worried about that most of the time, to be honest. It's the idea that's sickening, and the passing on of that idea is a viable notion that disturbs. We don't want to have sexual intercourse and in turn potentially harm an underdeveloped elementary school girl or boy's body and mind. That would be wrong. What we want to do is do that to fictional ones. Oh! Well, forgive me and my baseless accusations. Please go on and continue being a non-threatening member of society, you and your desire to be a fictional kitty fiddler. You righteous and just individual. It's this ideology that is numbing and on the other end of the spectrum possibly twisting a fragile and malleable youth just beginning to delve deep into the medium of anime. The concern presented in that video is not that people are indulging in their fantasies in real life. No, it is the idea that individuals should be allowed to have those desires, be proud of it, and spread that idea. That is what is seen as repulsive. And the language being used is not random. Importance is placed that the idea and ideology being transmitted as viable is sickening. It is the idea that is most volatile. It's the idea that's sickening, and the passing on of that idea is a viable notion that disturbs. It's this ideology that is numbing. Although Demolition D has publicly retracted his statements regarding Lolicon, the opinion in his video is still enlightening. The implications are self-evident. As a label, Lolicon is too dangerous of an idea to be accepted as normal because desires can corrupt people. This general mentality is closely echoed by the whole of society. The ideology that children can be thought of in a sexual manner is too disgusting and cannot be allowed to exist, so it must be shamed, suppressed, and even censored. It is not simply that only pedophiles are sexually attracted to children, but anyone that feels that way must be a pedophile or a deviant. They are people that are a danger to society and their communities. This sort of mentality and ideology creates an unspoken fear that cannot be discussed. The ultimate truth being suppressed is this. Anyone can be sexually attracted to children, even though they do not possess any defining sexual attributes. To even say such a thing may be audacious, however, ideology is the unspoken but crucial set of assumptions that underline social behavior. It is something you would never express as your belief, but it would catastrophically undermine your ability to function as it would disturb the official ideology through the mere exposure of its source. Recognizing the core of an ideology can be painful. It can shatter many personal illusions that were taken for granted. But it is a paradox that must be accepted and overcome to obtain freedom, both for yourself and those around you. 
It is only by accepting this truth that we become self-aware of our own actions within the frameworks of social structures. So, it must be said again, anyone could be attracted to children, including people that may not be pedophiles, regardless of defining sexual attributes. And there's nothing wrong with having perverse fantasies so long as they remain a fantasy. But society is not ready for this sort of acceptance or realization. And shaming people for their desires or fetishes simply leads to widespread discrimination. This is why the label of Lolicon is important and must be recognized. It openly declares sexual desires and recognizes its limitations. What needs to be recognized is not that sex or desires are bad, although some people do argue this, but that human nature can be violent, irrational or perverse and is expressed as such in art. Human imagination cannot and should not be suppressed. Pornography shows us our deepest desires at our core. They are eternal forces at work beneath and beyond social convention and can be expressed openly in art. Pornography cannot be separated from art. They intertwine with each other more than anyone can dare to admit. This is why people attempt to tame and suppress artistic pornography. It is voyeuristic of our desires. It makes many well-meaning people uncomfortable because it makes them complicit with the act itself. A person has the right to feel disgusted about another person's sexuality and desires, but that disgust should not be considered a valid justification to the base a person of their humanity. The will and moral view of a collective are unimportant compared to the rights of all individuals. Obscenity laws exist to protect the moral integrity of a society, but they are blatantly anti-free speech. Unjust laws, such as those in Canada, where lowly art is considered to be the same as child pornography, were placed by the means of an ideology and can only be fought ideologically with the defense of free speech. A subjectively based, undefined and unjust law can lead to human enslavement and its victims become its enforcers and enslave themselves. Even the possibility of censorship can lead to irrational fear. In the book, The End of Cool Japan, Patrick Galbraith notes, In October 1999, a new child pornography law in Japan passed amid intense global criticism and raised the possibility that certain forms of manga might now be illegal. Rather than wait for action by police and prosecutors, Kinokunya Books, a major retailer, sent a fax to all its stores telling employees to remove anything suspicious from the shelves. Among the manga removed were Miura's Berserk and Inui's Vagabond, both series for young adults that have won the Tezuka Osamu Cultural Prize. Significantly, neither of these works could, by any stretch of the imagination, be categorized as pornography, let alone child pornography. But they were still deemed suspicious because the dark fantasy series Berserk shows a child being sexually abused and the historical drama Vagabond shows an underage samurai warrior having sex. Lowly art cannot be simply defended on the grounds that it does not hurt anyone, but on the principles and values of free speech. At its core, the right to free speech is an aspect of the right to liberty. Individuals must have the right to think for themselves and use their minds as they so choose. They must have the right to express their thoughts, desires, and beliefs in material form, whether orally or in writing, without fear of losing their lives to a mob or facing government suppression. Freedom of speech is important because it protects the rights of unpopular minorities that the majority may wish did not exist. In essence, the right to free speech is the right to use your body and property to express ideas to anyone who chooses to listen. However, freedom of speech means freedom from interference, suppression or punitive action by the government and nothing else. For example, in 2017, 
the website Patreon made additional steps to remove bestiality, incest, sexual depiction of minors, and fetish content that is hard to distinguish from non-consensual sex. This applied both to live-action media and illustrations. People were displeased by the act and called it censorship, but it is not strictly the case. Censorship is a term pertaining only to governmental action. No action on the part of private entities is capable of censorship. The right to sell or spread your speech or ideas is given permission by the owners of the property. No private individual or agency can silence a person or suppress a publication. Only the government can do that. As such, Patreon can do as it pleases on its platform. However, a freer marketplace attracts the greatest potential of both artists and consumers, creating more money. Between ideology and money, Patreon chose to follow the belief that certain sexual depictions were too taboo to be allowed on their platform. Despite widespread condemnation, people were unable to make Patreon change their policies. The only way to challenge an ideology is for its opposite view to become more popular and to defend free speech as an absolute, even if it makes you feel uncomfortable. Ultimately, the right of those that seek pornography and art should not be infringed by unjust laws that protect the sensibilities of those that find desires offensive. What a community deems to be disgusting should never be an acceptable justification for censorship by the government or any form of personal discrimination. If a person does not want to see explicit content, then they are free to avoid it. Warning signs may be presented within private spaces and websites to telegraph that they contain sexual content, should they be open to the public. But all manner of artistic pornography should be allowed to exist in a society that holds value in liberty, freedom of speech, and freedom of expression. If a person is repulsed by any form of artistic expression, all they can do is look away, refuse to listen, or refuse to finance or support it in any way. It is ultimately their right to do so, and only such is the extent of their rights. A person's disgust for lowly art, as well as all other violent and taboo art, becomes a good test to see their loyalty of the principles of free speech. The Western anime audience, following the general trends of the Japanese artistic scene, is culturally impacted by their taste and state of sexual liberation. It is a part of our identity, and it should be something that is celebrated, not shamed. Although this video is about lowly art and lowly con, it can easily apply to all forms of artistic pornography that is deemed taboo by the public. Sexuality and desires are part of the human condition. They are too important to be ignored and suppressed. No matter how much I try, I can't find anything laudable in paedophilia. Well, that's because you think about the perhaps 5% who actually hurt children. The remaining 95% never live out their fantasies. Think about their suffering. Sexuality is the strongest force in human beings. To be born with a forbidden sexuality must be agonizing. The paedophile who manages to get through life with the shame of his desire, while never acting on it, deserves a bloody medal.